Ladies and gentlemen, Ari Wagner. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. We're thrilled to have you here. Congratulations on your Distinguished Cinematographer Award. It could not be more fitting for the work we've seen uh, today and, and this year. It's been remarkable. If you don't mind, I'm going to tape this for my own edification. <laughs> Sounds good. Because it's not every, you know, this is a real, this is just a real treat for me um, to be able to talk about your extraordinary work. So Ari, about Power of the Dog, um, this is a movie that seems to have a foot in two centuries. It's very much about a, a moment of transition in American culture and a moment, obviously, of personal and psychological transition. So, and it's so beautifully expressed in the visual language of the film. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, um, I actually haven't, hadn't seen the film for probably a couple of months and I decided to watch it today. <laughs> it was really nice to be here with you all. Um, yeah, we, so when I first uh, became involved with, with the project, um, I was actually in the supermarket doing my Christmas grocery shopping and I looked down my phone and it said Jane Campion. And I thought, okay. <laughs> um, we'd worked together only once very briefly on a very tiny commercial and I just assumed she'd dialed the wrong number. <laughs> I answered anyway and she said she'd read a book and she was writing a screenplay and would I be interested in maybe being involved and uh, of course in the back of my mind I was thinking like yes of course <laughs> what a dream and uh, but she said the only caveat was she needed a cinematographer who wanted to start pretty much straight away and this was about a year before we were shooting so uh, again what a dream to have that amount of preparation time um, so we spent almost a year chatting. It wasn't kind of full-time one-on-one, but uh, I didn't do, as soon as I was, um, as soon as I got the, the job, I, I couldn't think about anything else, really. Um, my mind was in the 1920s, in Montana, deep diving into anything I could consume. <laughs> um, and yeah, we, we spent about a month uh, full-time, one-on-one, -on -one, just planning the storyboards and how, how we were going to shoot it. And um, I'm someone that loves rules, um, visual rules. Um, and turns out Jane, the rebel that she is, cannot handle rules whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> well, this um, is creative tension in the making. Yeah, so I thought, um, yeah, how are we going to do this together? But um, the overriding, I guess, guiding philosophy we came up with was we we really wanted the photography to be um, I guess non-judgmental um, and not too leading or um, to not prescribe what what an audience was um, making of a particular moment um, so uh, because we we knew in the, the architecture of the film that uh, it's building towards a very particular end. Um, and we also wanted it to be a film where we could, uh, for it to be a kind of strongly retrospective experience as well, that hopefully you experience the film in real time and then uh, perhaps over the coming hours and maybe days, um, your mind might come back to some, some moments. And I think having the photography not tell you exactly what you should be thinking in all those moments allows you to go back and, and maybe have a different interpretation or maybe even watch the film a second time and, and see if there was some moments that you wanted to interpret again because I think it is also a film about first impressions. Definitely. And uh, we didn't, uh, I think people are kind of, as viewers, we're, we're judgy and enough to not have the camera have to <laughs> add a bit of judgment on top of that and uh, and, and we didn't want to make a film that was emotionally um, manipulative because the, there's enough tension there that we, we shouldn't need to convince with the photography. Or as Jane was saying, uh, would always say, like, not too much icing. Not too much icing. Yeah, not too much frosting on the cake, you know, right. just the right amount. Um, like schlag yeah. mit schlag, I think, yeah. in the German. <laughs> um, 
So when you said you spent all that time thinking about it before you even met with Jane, are you making lookbooks? Are you assembling images? Are you leaving through visual references? Tell us a little bit about your creative process. Um, all of, yeah, all, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, one was the big decision we had to make was to decide a kind of color palette. Um, we, we really wanted something that was going to unify um, the disparate locations, the studio and the exterior, the everything, unify it. Um, and we explored every option from kind of very vivid, we even explored the idea of black and white. Um, and I, I put together kind of three documents, I guess, to present to Jane as some, some options with, with photos from a hand-coloured look to a, mm -hmm. all, all different ideas. And um, this is one, I actually refound that document yesterday, <laughs> randomly, and um, the one we went for was this one we called Dusty. <laughs> Dusty. Um, and so, yeah, taking from the environment and um, the colours of the horses, yeah. the, the grasses. The wood. The, Timber, yeah, the just dusty and um, kind of, I guess, sun bleached look. Um, and then we also discovered a photographer called Evelyn Cameron, um, mm. who I had never, I didn't know before, but it was a woman who was an English woman working in the, uh, who moved to Montana and uh, in the 20, 1920s and was taking photographs, which was an incredible effort at that time. <laughs> Um, and we were just really inspired by her, her eye, I guess, or her observations of the kind of thing she was interested in, which is, I think, if you could sum it up, it's maybe like the relationship between people and the place, and, and then these kind of delicate moments of, um, I don't know, not, not, not typical kind of, I don't know, ranch life, but a woman, an outsider's view, who's also a woman, and then, I don't know, was also really inspired by this person who was, uh, I don't know, she's got amazing diaries and all this the kind of thing I was doing for a year, going down some very <laughs> deep rabbit holes, reading diaries. And, and um, yeah, not only was she running this ranch, um, the diaries are amazing. You should definitely read them because she makes it. All, all the men in her life were very <laughs> uh, lazy and incompetent, as she oh. describes them. <laughs> um, so she had to do everything and she would manage to take photos as well. And, Anyway, I was very inspired by her, and I thought if she can do all that, we can we can make this film because it was a daunting prospect as well. It's it's just exquisite, um, and obviously Andrew Wyeth I, I, was a reference. Yes. Um, with just that beautiful. And, and did you build that the house? Was that built? We did. Yes, um, that was one of the first jobs. Yes, <laughs> early indeed. On. It looked like it. Find the ranch, find the find the location, and build and decide where the house is and, and where all, everything is because it actually. Everything kind of needs to go in quite a specific yeah. place for the yes. for the story to work. Um, and Grant Major was our production designer, who's an incredible New Zealand designer. He did all of the Lord of the Rings um, uh, movies, and he had actually worked with Jane. Um, I don't know how many years ago, probably 30 years ago or so, on on Angel at My Table. Um, so they were coming back together, and um, but I was by far the the youngest head of department by maybe 30 years or so. So that was also had its own <laughs> uh, kind of weight to it. And then, so you're obviously um, collaborating with Jane on the visual language. I also want to get back to the framing because the, those wonderful shots through the windows of the chow house reminded me almost of it. It's almost like a um, recapitulation of early cinema, you know, the old, mm -hmm. the old, kin the, the old yes. magic lanterns, right? With the, with the discrete frames. Um, it was just a beautiful, it was just a, a really beautiful motif. Yes, yeah. And also very symbolic of that era where things are shifting and people's, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's role, women's roles are shifting and technology, people are riding horses and driving cars and it's all mm -hmm. kind of at once. I just thought that was a beautiful moment. But then obviously this is deeply psychological ultimately. And so tell us a little bit about how a cinematographer collaborates with the actors and, and just how much communication are you doing and, and tell us what that's what that relationship is like. Yeah, we're, we, I mean, we're very intertwined. We're really, because uh, I, um, when I can, I also operate a camera. Um, so we're really there. <laughs> you can't disconnect yourself from, from the moment. Um, 
And so, yeah, we're working very closely day to day. And, and I also feel very privileged to be kind of the first viewer, really, directly through the lens at what they're doing. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a very collaborative process of um, obviously saying we, we did all the planning beforehand, so um, we more or less knew what we wanted the shots to be and yeah. then we see what they're going to do and, and adapt a little bit yeah. for both or um, maybe we've thought of how they might move in the room and then they do it and it's way better than we <laughs> could have planned, so change some bits there. And, um, then, the, if, if I might, if I may, do you do you spend some time early just establishing trust? I mean, is that a factor? Is that an issue, especially with a story like this, where you're really getting, you know, especially I would imagine Benedict. I mean, he is so vulnerable, even though his character isn't at first blush vulnerable. Um, it's just such a raw and undefended performance in many ways. Yeah, um, and he was he was in character from the get-go, so oh <laughs> I really only met Benedict a few weeks ago. Uh, before that, it was just Phil Burbank. <laughs> so that was also an experience, you know, usually you asked an actor, so do you mind taking it on the next take? Could you take a little step to your left? I'm gonna move your mark. You're not asking Benedict, you're asking Phil Burbank, so you really have to uh, pick your moments as to whether you're gonna go to the effort of asking or not. No. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> so maybe I should move a light instead. Would snap at you? <laughs> Snap, but <laughs> definitely uh, it, you'd, you'd feel a, you know, know that he doesn't want to. There's an edge. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. That's um, fascinating. But then, yeah, then there's the really vulnerable moments that you get to see, um, which we actually decided to, um, I guess we'd say we'd planned for them to be unplanned and to be handheld and really adapt to... Um, whatever was going to happen in the um, that kind of willow glade yes. with the scarf, um, we, we really wanted it to be, a, I guess, like a closed set where you would usually do an intimate scene, yeah. but in the outdoors and also in a way to recreate the kind of situation that I think a lot of actors and directors would love to get back to, which is kind of the film school days when you've just got yourself and a camera and an actor, and so we kind of. I guess sent everyone away and it was just me and Jane and Benedict kind of in there and um, really responding to each other. Um, but yeah, I'd say definitely our relationship changed myself and Phil <laughs> after we'd been through that together. Um, that was an amazing yeah. sequence. That was a really just a magical, um, magical passage in, in the film. And yeah. you filmed, I think I'm correct in saying, you filmed it digitally but with Vintage lenses. That's correct, yeah. We, um, we use a Panavision uh, pa uh, Ultra Panatar, which are halfway between spherical and anamorphic. So mm -hmm. um, for the geeks, it was a 1.3 times anamorphic, so um, not quite anamorphic, but yeah, very so, old lenses. So explain wh what that creates in terms of the mood and the, and the look and, and trend. how do we how did that make us feel? How did that change how we watch this movie? It's very subtle, I think, actually. Mm -hmm. I know this is maybe sacrilegious, but I think maybe vintage lenses are given maybe too much kind of credit for what they do. They are very beautiful when you can see the, this kind of softness around the edges and beautiful shallow focus if you choose. Um, but in many ways, I think the bigger decisions about where the camera is and how it moves and, and what lens you're on, a long lens slightly further away or a wider lens closer, that, that has a big psychological effect on an audience, especially kind of cumulatively over the whole film. And I do, I do love lenses. Um, but that's your palette, you know, you know as a, yeah. in addition to color and light, that's really, it, yeah. it determines so much in terms of, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate feeling of the film. I was incredibly, even though, you know, again, this is an intensely psychological and interpersonal drama, you do have those classic big screen epic western, like the cattle drive. And, yes, yeah. Uh, the, I don't know if it was a drone, you know, like those beautiful sweeping landscape shots. That must have, was that the first time you'd done, worked on that kind of canvas? Uh, yeah, that was that was a scary kind of prospect, actually. Both yeah. neither Jane and I had worked with 
that number of animals <laughs> not many of us have, unless that's your job. Um, uh, so we planned them particularly, specifically, and yeah, it was, I mean, how did it go? Treat. Was it was it did, it did it go okay? Was it a nightmare? Would you do it again? Did you? Yeah, we you had learn, we, we had incredible cattle. I guess wranglers. Yeah. That's their life. They really know. They really know cattle really well, and they're relatively predictable as an animal. So even when we'd say like, "What do you think they'll do with the drone?" and they'd say, "Okay, well, let's let's do." fly the drone over five times today and then maybe a couple of times tomorrow and then by then they'll, they won't mind. And yeah. It was exactly what happened. So I think we had a great experience. Actually, another thing is though, um, there's maybe only about 100 cattle we had at, at one time and the rest you see are actually uh, visual effects, um, <laughs> which I'm really pleased with the result because it... Um, Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to know, I don't know, I guess part of the job is knowing what to... Sure, we'd love everything to be real, but then there's actually a practical side of it where if Absolutely. you want everything to be real, it's going to take double as long and Absolutely. expensive. And, and yeah, the visual effects are... I have to credit our visual effects supervisor, Jay Hawkins, who's um, actually a Californian um, guy, and he's inc yeah incredible he's collaborator as well. I think that's a, a role that's often uh, deep down the credits, but it's actually an incredibly creative yeah. role. It's seamless. I would never have known. Yeah. Um, so, I wanted. I do want to get to Zola, but but I. How did you get started? Tell us a little bit about your your background and your journey. Um, I guess I grew up in a very creative kind of analog household. Um, my father's a visual artist. He's a painter. Um, my mother was uh, did ceramics, made jewelry, and. Um, we didn't really have a movie, television kind of childhood. It was a lot more, um, uh, but very visual, that's it. So, um, yeah, then I discovered photography in high school and spent a lot of time kicking around in the dark room after school till the cleaners would come and kick you out <laughs> as long as I could. Um, and then uh, I was also really loved writing and then, then I discovered this thing called cinematography, which. I really think is the combination of photography and writing. It's the visual storytelling, and that got me really excited. So I um, applied for film school, and yeah, one thing led to another. And then that was still at the time when you were you training on film stock. You weren't. It was. It was. This is the pre-digital age. It was just on the cusp, really. Mm. It was before these kind of digital cameras existed. So we did mostly 16. Yeah. Um, and then, not too long after that. Um, the first red camera came out. And, yeah. The reason I'm interested is that because you grew up in a art, in a household with artists, um, do you think that working with film stock sort of gives you an understanding of cinema as a material culture and a material object more than maybe you know? I think digital kind of dematerialized film in a, in a certain kind of way and then then it gets rematerialized in <laughs> color timing and lenses and things like that but I don't know maybe I'm overthinking it but I just am curious as to your do you think it made a difference having had that experience even if it was pre-digital I think what it does is because film stock is finite it's you've got a limit yeah. and in film school you've got no money so you don't have much so you really have to plan what you want um, and you don't roll the camera till you know everything's perfect and you've checked everything and you've planned it. And, um, and if you do make a mistake, then you might have to lose something <laughs> later in the day. So I think it, there's a discipline and a rigor that if you learn in that way, um, yeah, you, it feels very frivolous to just roll the camera um, yeah. in, the, in the way that you can if you... If you've only ever shot digital, it's easy just to just to roll and see what happens. Right, it's yeah. just a completely different attitude toward the work. And then, do you, as a cinematographer, are you there in post production to make sure with the color correction is the way you want it? Right. I mean, you don't hand your things over and then walk away at that point. I hope. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I take a, uh, during the editing. I'm usually doing some another project, and then I'll uh, as much as I can be available for the color timing, which is usually about. I think we're about three weeks on this one. Um, and uh, yeah, I love that part of the job. It's a really special kind of uh, moment. And also, 
uh, I guess there's things that only I know I need to come back and fix because <laughs> at a certain point somewhere when there was half an hour left in the day and I knew Jane and the actors wanted some time, I would have not done something that I know I can do later. Later, it's, um, yeah, that's, uh, five minutes on a film set is, is a really gold, golden coin that you can't just take from a director if, if you're never in the moment. So I would definitely leave, uh, yeah. The, I feel like the color grade, I've got maybe 20% of the work still to do. So I would try to not, <laughs> yeah. yeah, give that away. Interesting. So then in, on Zola, which is the other film you shot this year, which was just a delicious, <laughs> a delicious, beautiful film, you did shoot. You went back to 16 for that. And so tell us a little bit about those conversations with Janixa um, about those choices and what, what your collabor collaboration was like. Yeah, Janixa is an amazing director. Um, he has such two like, incredibly different films and two directors that are also incredibly different, but in many ways very similar, um, kind of unafraid and very rigorous in their work and extreme attention to detail. And um, yeah, Janexa knew from the get-go she wanted to shoot the film on 16. Um, Why? What, what did she, what was behind that, do you know? She just loves how it looks, yeah. and I do as well. Yeah. And I think it's definitely not the obvious choice because it's a film that's, I guess, in many ways about the internet. Exactly. And it's very kind of um, now, I guess you could say, or a few years I, ago. I will interrupt. Yeah. This is a movie, for those who don't know, it was based on a Twitter, a viral Twitter thread, um, which is, you know, as, as Ari said, it's very of the moment, and the visual language that you and Janixa worked out um, integrates the tweets in on this in this, on the screen. So again, that 16 mil is kind of a counterintuitive choice when you're talking about something that was literally just grabbed from social media. Yeah, it's a very playful kind of film, I think, mm -hmm. um, with the form and it's like many ways it's self-aware. It kind of makes you aware of the filmmaking sometimes and um, almost kind of fourth wall type of thing and. I think we liked how 16 mil fitted into that as well. There's kind of a playful, kind of, I don't know, old school something, something about it. And also we loved how, we both really loved how 16 mil, how film looks on skin. And mm. there's a lot of skin in Zola. <laughs> a lot Indeed. of beautiful skin that we um, wanted to look great. It does look great. It, and it, 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 this is a question I've been dying to ask you. I've been sort of asking it almost all weekend as mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been watching different films and it's, and it's about the female gaze. It's, well, let's start with the male gaze. You know I mean? Mm. I think cinema is a medium. I remember when we were here with Greta Gerwig a few years ago and she said cinema was invented by men looking at women. I mean, that is such a fundamental part of cinematic grammar um, that the camera has almost become a proxy for, for the male gaze. And so mm -hmm. as a a woman behind the camera, how do you, can you unpack that? Do you, can you disarm that? Can you interrupt it or disrupt it? Is it baked in? Just tell me how you've navigated that over the years, both you and the women directors you've worked with. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd say that the male gaze definitely predates cinema. <laughs> it was there in the- Well said. Art and, um, you know, and even which artists got to be legitimized and which were pushed down or plenty of amazing female artists that were supporting someone else that got the credit. And <laughs> um, it's a really complex question. Um, and I, I don't know actually how to answer that other than, I guess I only know how to see how I see um, and um, I love working with all kinds of directors and I, one of my favorite things about working with a different director on a different project is you get to learn how someone else sees the world um, and try and incorporate the way you see it into theirs. To, by the time you get to day one, hopefully you're kind of, it's a, a mix of, of the two or um, what I love about Jane, for instance, is she has an incredibly um, beautiful way of seeing the world. It's very kind of, incredibly curious, open-hearted, almost 
um, childlike kind of um, observations where she manages to see things that a lot of people have forgotten about or, or aren't, aren't kind of in awe of anymore. Um, and, but then when you do see them, you're kind of somehow reminded of just the beauty of the everyday and how something also, how something kind of imperfect can be incredibly beautiful. And, and I think that, that that's very infused in this film as well. Um, Definitely. And, and then how it also infuses into people's actual film making, like what the experience of being on set with them is like and how they like their film set to run also is part of how they see the world. Jane's incredibly kind of, uh, I think she's a really actually interesting kind of uh, mix of both traditionally male and, and female. I mean, as, as we all are. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, but her, her film sets are very, both incredibly, uh, the work is taken very seriously, but the environment is very lighthearted. Mm -hmm. um, and for her, and, and me, I learned, I think I finally learnt this, and I'm so grateful to her, but that the best ideas um, and are able to come when everyone is, is at ease, um, and that creativity and risk-taking can happen when there's, um, uh, there's not tension. Uh, yeah, um, which a film set can sometimes be. And I think that in terms of working with women, maybe, I'd say that's maybe one of the biggest differences, like not, not necessarily the result, maybe it's influenced by, into it, but, but what is the working environment like? And then I guess, it, of course, it affects what the film is because you're kind of, well, yeah, I don't know how, how everyone's feeling in the room. I think it does like marinate somehow into the footage. Um, yeah. I think you're right, and I think that's what made Zola, to get back to Zola, when I was watching it, I was like, what's going on? You know, in terms of that uh, objectification, I know at one point that project had been attached to a male director, and mm -hmm. I just think something fundamental, fundamentally changed when it was you and Janixa um, operating that, that machine. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I saw, yesterday I saw The Lost Daughter. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen Oh, yes, yeah. indeed. This came up, I interviewed yeah. Dakota Johnson after that. So we talked about a little bit yeah. about that too, yeah. And I just loved it. And again, that's a, another female mm -hmm. director, DP, duo. But I think I really love that, um, I mean, I love the film overall, but I kind of love that for some reason it, there was a way that the the difference between their two bodies, um, Dakota and Olivia, was, was not really part of the story. It was just there and I don't know, I don't know how the photographer, and I, I can't, couldn't dissect it and tell you how, but it was just like not the most interesting thing to those filmmakers. The most interesting thing was about the relationships and the similarities or that just wasn't like laboured on somehow. That was, uh, I was thinking about that a lot yesterday and really, I don't know, just, I, can't, I couldn't dissect it or define how, how you would go about doing that, but I, see, but I feel it and I see it. Yeah, well, we see it and we feel it in your work as well, Ari Wagner. Thank you so much thank for taking you. the time to be here. Congratulations again. Thank you. Ari, it's with great pleasure. On behalf of the Middleburg Film Festival, we are presenting you with the Distinguished Cinema Photography Award for 2021. Congratulations.